All right, my name is David Mason. Uh, I'm a member of the Lashley Lab, uh, and I'm going to give you guys a lecture about dispersal and distributions. Uh, my research focuses on seed dispersal. Uh, right now, I'm actually in a truck uh, recording this lecture because I'm setting up an experiment exploring how uh, animals disperse seeds when they perish. Um, and if that sounds interesting to you, you should uh, ask Dr. Lashley to tell you some more about it. All right, this lecture sort of gets at a fundamental question to biogeography, to ecology, uh, with relevance to human society in a, in a number of ways, uh, economic and cultural, um, you know, where we should set up a settlement, where we can find food, uh, where we can find resources, things like that. Which species, where, why, and why not? It's a big why question. All right, this question was first asked and answered uh, by Alexander von Humboldt. He was a uh, a scientist in the 1700s. He traveled all the way across Russia uh, in a horse and carriage. He traveled all over the Americas. Um, and he was into pretty much everything about nature, including this uh, event pictured on the right, which was an experiment exploring uh, electromagnetism uh, by, by putting horses in a pool full of uh, electric eels. Uh, kind of also coupled this with experiments where we put magnets under his skin. So kind of a, uh, a, a wacky and interesting person. But another thing he did was uh, notice that wherever he traveled all over the world, he started seeing similar plant communities at similar altitudes. Um, this was a pretty new and exciting idea at the time. Um, however obvious it may seem now, but uh, he sort of established that uh, plant distributions were determined by uh, climate and soil. All right, I, I mentioned that there is some relevance to this question um, uh, for human society, and, and we'll just focus on one economic uh, one economic pathway that is relevant for now. Uh, imagine if you were uh, hunting gold and you wanted to do so using the distribution of a plant. Um, it's probably not an effective way that I would recommend, um, but you could hypothetically do it. So this is the cottonwood tree here, uh, and it's associated with gold. Uh, so if you had the distribution of cottonwood across the United States here in the, in the, uh, the states and the provinces that are filled in uh, green, uh, you could see that, well, you could really look for gold pretty much uh, anywhere except for maybe the west and the far north, and definitely not Hawaii. Um, but a lot of those uh, areas where uh, cottonwood supposedly occurs are actually maybe desert or plains or mountains. Uh, you need to look at a finer scale um, because cottonwood is associated with water, um, riparian areas. So you could look for a map of uh, rivers and watersheds, sort of narrow your search in that way. You can also use dispersal and distributions in this why question to explore uh, geologic history. This is the distribution of uh, wolves, Canis lupus. You see that they are all over the world. Uh, they're in India and Saudi Arabia and Yemen, down in New Mexico. Um, how did they get all over the world uh, across these oceans? Um, and we imagine that they can't swim uh, quite that far. Um, so the only real plausible explanation is that there was some kind of land bridge. Um, and that is, of course, true. That's how uh, a lot of organisms, including uh, Homo sapiens, got to the Americas, or at least one way. You can also use dispersal and distributions to uh, explore ecological theory. Um, this topic will probably be covered in an entire lecture, I imagine, so I'll just touch on it briefly. Um, the idea is uh, the number of species you find in an island, uh, an island could be defined as any area that's different from uh, its surroundings. So, you know, an actual island or maybe uh, tops of mountains, like a, like a, a sky island, uh, or even say, you know, if you're a plant and you special, or sorry, you're, a, you're an insect and you specialize on certain plants, you know, patches of those plants would probably be an island embedded in, you know, a matrix of other habitat types. Uh, 
the larger the island is and the closer it is to a mainland or to the to a larger version of that island, um, the more species you will find there. This is the theory of island biogeography, sort of merges the species area relationship um, with dispersal distance uh, to explain a fundamental pattern uh, in ecology. So this dispersal distribution uh, can be relevant for a number of reasons. Uh, just another uh, other economic or cultural values. You can think about something like the um, horseshoe crab, for example, that's kind of spread apart in different places on the East Coast and the and the ocean. Um, and the blood is extremely valuable to pharmaceutical companies. So people do map the distributions of these uh, specifically for for financial gain. Um, probably more interesting to me is this idea that it can inform other things that we're interested in. So the, the whole natural world, uh, sort of like a puzzle, and the more puzzle pieces you have, um, the easier it is to determine what the final puzzle piece looks like. In other words, if you know something about dispersal and distributions, it can inform something about the population genetics or the natural history of an of a organism. Conversely, uh, if you know the evolutionary or a, or a geologic history of the land masses and the way that they moved moved around uh, with continental drift, that, that could tell you something about the distribution of the organisms. This topic is relevant uh, with global change. Pictured here on the right, uh, we see the distribution of zebra mussels, which are an introduced species uh, associated with um, people. So you know, we alter the environment. Uh, and we also alter the, the dispersal uh, abilities of organisms. So dispersal is the movement of individuals. It can also be defined as any movement that causes gene flow. It happens in three phases, uh, departure, transfer, and settlement. There's some general patterns here. We see this bird species here. Uh, the farther you go away from the, the place of birth, the less of them you have. Another way of saying that is uh, more of them disperse less far away. And this pattern is seen in many organisms, uh, including plants. Basic types of dispersal, you have uh, organisms that are motile for their entire uh, existence versus animals that are, or sorry, organisms that are, are only able to move during a specific uh, dispersive phase. You have uh, dispersal that occurs when an organism is born, natal, uh, and dispersal that occurs when an organism is seeking to breed. And then you have density independent and dependent dispersal. And that's what I have pictured here on the right. Uh, these are aphids, they feed on plants um, and they keep reproducing very quickly. Um, Basically, once they get crowded enough, which they determine by bumping into each other uh, enough times is, is, is the hypothesis, uh, the next individuals are born with wings, elate individuals, uh, and they fly away to a new plant. There's different costs and benefits to dispersal. Um, it might be a good exercise to think about an organism that you're interested in and then walk through these examples and try to sort of customize it um, just to sort of get yourself thinking about how dispersal benefits organisms or I guess how it can also uh, negatively impact them. Dispersal range can be constrained by the environment or barriers. Uh, these are the rock hopper penguins here down on the left. Um, and they hypothetically could swim um, to anywhere in the ocean, I guess. Um, but they're constrained by the environment because their foraging behavior uh, is sort of customized to their environment. So uh, different, uh, basically different water temperatures in different places uh, kind of determines how these rock hoppers will uh, hunt, uh, how far down they'll dive and how far away from the colony they'll go. There's some argument about whether these are subpopulations in the different colors or whether they're different species. Um, but the point still remains is that they, they could be intermingling, but um, they either 
do so rarely or, or they don't um, because of these environmental constraints. We also have barriers to dispersal. Uh, we have these central chimpanzees and the eastern chimpanzees and the, and the bonobos here uh, separated by the Congo River here and, and the, I guess, a tributary of the Congo River as well. Um, basically, these populations are isolated because they cannot cross the river or they, they can only do so rarely maybe. There's many different kinds of dispersal mechanisms, I'm sure. Most of you listening to the lecture are aware that you know animals can swim and fly and 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 move in other ways. So I'm going to talk about stuff that uh, you may not know. Um, many organisms move in a dormant stage, uh, and also there uh, is a type of animal dispersal called foracy, um, where uh, the animals can attach to other animals to sort of hitch a ride, and that's what we see this pseudo scorpion doing down here. I'm going to focus a little more on plant dispersal because I figure that's probably a little bit more of a mysterious area to you guys. Um, plants can disperse themselves, they can be dispersed by wind and water, and they can be dispersed by animals. When they are dispersed by themselves, we say they have no vector. When they are dispersed by wind, water, or animals, we say they have uh, a vector. And that vector can either be either be abiotic in the case of wind and water or biotic in the case of animals. So some examples of self-dispersal, we have geranium here, which uh, throws its seeds through ballo quarry. We have a vena here, which the seeds crawl along the ground uh, by absorbing and, and uh, desiccating with moisture. And then we have caria here, which uh, just basically drops these big nuts onto the ground um, and they roll. So gravity disperses uh, the plant with barrel cori. Then we have hydro cori, um, which can be accomplished with either big fruit that may be sort of hollow inside so that they can float along the water or just even smaller little boxes that can float along. These are called rattle boxes here. And then we have uh, wind dispersal, which typically occurs with either some, some wings or some other kind of uh, feathery filament that allows the, the seed to float on the air. And we'll see that there's different sort of uh, qualities of these fruit that, that goes along with their dispersal style. Um, you might see a big fruit is associated with barrow quarry. You might see, uh, you know, wings being associated with a Nemo cori. Um, we look at uh, zoo cori, we may see either that there's some kind of uh, hooks or barbs that connect so that the seeds can ride on the animal, that's epizoo cori. Or we might see that the seed is encapsulated in some kind of fruit which encourages consumption, as in the case of endozoo cori. So if we look at some just quick examples, we don't have to know that much about the plant uh, and even know the plant's name to determine how it's probably dispersed. So we can just look at the, at the shape of it. And here we see uh, this is uh, where the seed would be attached to some sort of uh, filaments, um, some sort of hairs. And that would tell us this is probably wind dispersed. Again, we have a, a, a maple a samara here and we see some wings here. So we know that these are probably dispersed by wind as well. And now we see uh, a fruit here that has this fleshy uh, uh, pericarp with seeds uh, situated all the way in the inside of it to encourage consumption. And we know that that's probably dispersed by animals. Dispersal has a lot of consequences for ecological communities. The most important one is that it kind of determines what is, or at least partially determines what is inside the community, what organisms are there. And that is sort of the framework that all the other ecological interactions are even built upon. So it's one of, uh, one of the most important processes. All right, we're gonna talk a little bit about distributions. Um, we can speak about biological range and I've listed a bunch of different ways that you can sort of uh, characterize ranges and all these different ways according to breeding, um, 
geographic or temporal qualifiers. So you might say like, you know, pre-human settlement or, or something like that. Uh, biotic and abiotic factors can affect the distribution. Um, if you think about something like predation or disease, uh, they're the things other than dispersal that can affect the distribution. You know, maybe an animal can reach a certain area, but it often doesn't because of one of these factors. The most common distribution pattern is, is uh, clumped. We see that with patchy resources. So um, here we have a picture of the African savanna in a watering hole. And of course, a lot of animals are clumped around there, uh, both individuals of the same species and different species. You can also see it when individuals are unable to move. Um, you could see that with something like the crested caracari here. Uh, or the juveniles are stuck in the nest. They cannot. They cannot leave that area. Think about it with, uh, you know, other organisms that can't move as well, like a barnacle or something. We also see animals group up uh, in herds to escape predation, or conversely, uh, to increase their hunting efficiency. These are African wild dogs. can also see uniform or regular distribution patterns. This is a satellite image of great gerbil burrows, and you'll see that they are pretty regularly dispersed throughout there, pretty evenly distributed. You may also see it with animals that have some kind of, uh, some kind of territory going on. So you know, if they have single individuals have territories, um, or this is a picture of a lek, so, uh, animals that you know, position themselves and, and evenly spaced apart and defend little patches of ground for breeding purposes. You can also see random distribution patterns, though this is the, the least common. Um, these are uh, oyster larvae here um, that are carried by currents and similar we have um, dandelion seas which are carried by wind. Species distribution models are a big topic. Um, a lot of the qualified people uh, in the WEC department who are experts or, or who use these things. Um, I'm not one of them, but I can explain the basic idea is that you're gonna take your uh, environmental, characteristics, uh, environmental characteristics that you think are important to this organism's uh, distribution and kind of combine that with observations and with information about the uh, environment in the surrounding area to predict where that organism could possibly exist. Um, and he, here you see this example, we're doing it with rainfall and altitude and some observations to predict where we would see it. All right, that's all I got. Um, I appreciate y'all. Um, uh, bearing with me. Um, uh, thank you for letting me uh, give this lecture. It was, it was, uh, it was interesting. Um, I didn't get to talk a lot about migrations, but they are really, really interesting, cool things that happen all over the world uh, with all different kinds of organisms. And I just wanted to throw this up here to give you guys something else to explore potentially. This is a distribution of the sandhill crane. Um, and you'll see that Florida gets its own special population that comes up from the Great Lakes area down into uh, in the Florida, which is pretty cool.